talked a little bit about like how we went down and said, really, you were the one that um, started looking into this and found that really interesting statistic about the S&P 500. Mm-hmm. Right? You, you, you carve out just the top handful of stocks and a returns crater over the last year or two. Right. So we start digging into this and it's, so what does that mean? Okay. Well, like, what does it mean if the, the biggest stocks of the S&P 500 basically carried all the water in terms of returns? Well, because they were the largest weightings because the S&P 500 is cap-based. So the larger the company, the larger the weighting in the S&P 500. And so these, you know, do- or half a dozen to a dozen companies um, consist of about like 35% of the S&P 500. So if they're doing well, it looks like the economy is even doing well when actually even the underlying companies maybe are not. Mm-hmm. What's fascinating to me about this, and so I'm going to make some projection here. This is not predictions, but let's just talk through some of the things that are on my radar and that we're researching right now in our investment committee. So the cost of capital is changing, right? We talked about Interest rates are much higher right now, mm-hmm. and we're seeing that in everything. We're seeing it, uh, and what we're starting to see it show up in is in a change in the amount of free cash flow available within on, on company balance sheets. Right, right. The, the inflation is chipping away at that, and when you say cost of capital, it's if you have to borrow money to operate. Mm-hmm. Right. And and this isn't terribly uncommon. Like a lot of companies, they have a cycle where they have to build something and sell it to get money back. If you're right. going to build a car, you have to build it first, then sell it and get paid. So you may borrow money to finance the build of that vehicle in order to get it sold and get repaid. So that happens on a line of credit basis, typically. And if interest rates go up, that it's means more expensive. it's more expensive to borrow the money for your operation. Mm-hmm. So your free cash flow or the margin in your business starts to, we call it margin compression, mm-hmm. right? where like there's just less margin available because the cost of doing business, the cost of capital has gone up. Now, let's think about this for a second. Okay? And again, not offering advice, just encouraging everybody to think. If you are a growth company right now, so let's mm-hmm. talk about like we'll just use Google as an example, okay? Because that gives you a sense of like, okay, here's a big tech company, pays its people a lot of money, mm-hmm. it makes a lot of money, it's just sort of a, an advertising linchpin in the economy, and it's a bellwether for the economy in that respect. But it's also unique because it's it's got a, a lot of different things. It's got tech, it's got services, it's got servers, it's really wired into the economy big, mm-hmm. okay? So again, and again, I'm not telling you buy Google or not buy Google. That's not what we're doing here. Just right. an example. But let's think about how Google currently doesn't pay a dividend to investors. At least no. I don't think it does. No, it does not. Right? And so what is it doing? It's taking its profits and it's reinvesting into growing more Google. Mm-hmm. Right? It's taking those profits and it's internally eating them for growth. Now, in business, this is kind of interesting because when when a company consumes its profits on what we, they often call it capex, right, capital expenditures, mm-hmm. uh, or operational expenses, then that ceases to be a profit, and now it becomes a new part of the business. So, if you buy up another company, which we see Google do that sort of thing, right, or you put a bunch of money into research and development to create new things then those profits are not being paid out to investors or shareholders, but rather being paid back into the organization for growth. Right. So one has to look at the rate of growth now and consider that in comparison as an investor, like, hey, I could invest in Google. And how fast are they growing compared to other investments that I can Mm -hmm. get with lesser risk? And so growth companies have to achieve higher growth rates in an environment where there's more economic headwinds because the cost of capital is higher. Right. So they're by by in a sort of default and circumstance, they look less attractive when capital costs are higher if they can't sustain their growth rates. Right. Which when you're a super giant mega corporation like Google, how do you double yeah. in size when you're already super mega giant? Yeah. 
I, it becomes pretty staggering to think, well, how can a company that's got a trillion dollar valuation become a two trillion dollar right. company? Inflation will do some of it, mm-hmm. but how do you make the company twice as valuable when it's already that big? The first trillion is the hardest. Okay. <laughs> that's probably true. Because <laughs> if you can't get there, how do you ever get to the right. second trillion? <laughs> well, yeah, again, we, we see this expansion of money, right? But I, I do think it calls into question, like, where else could you put your money? Right. And if you had those headwinds, is it as attractive? Right. Now, here's the real tricky question, Justin. Of those stocks that make up the majority of the return of the S&P 500, how many of them are paying a dividend? I would probably less than half. Yeah. And those that are paying a dividend, what does that dividend look like compared to a treasury? Yeah, it's very small. Yeah. So all of this to suggest that, and, and it's, it's even scarier if they're paying a small dividend, right? Mm-hmm. Be, and wh- why? Well, the I guess. Question. Are they flirting with their growth force value? So <laughs> There's some of that. And when you, one of the valuation methods, just like a treasury, is you compare treasury yields. So if you have a, a treasury that you've owned for a while and the new yields get published for new treasuries, mm-hmm. what you own gets compared to what now exists. Right. And if rates have, you know, if yields have changed, your principal value may change. You know, if you have a treasury paying you 2% and new treasuries pay 5 that 2% treasury is less attractive to the market. Right. Like who wants to buy it from you when they're getting paid less than buying a new one? Right. So they're likely to offer you less than what you paid for what for that treasury. So in in which case you have downside risk that your principal in your is is worth less today and you'd have to hold it to maturity or accept less if you wanted to sell it. Now think about dividend stocks. A dividend that's below 10-year treasury suggests that that stock unless it has a really high growth rate, may be overpriced relative to a risk-free rate of return. 